Director of Publishing Studies here and the Nonfiction Specialist in Creative Writing in the English Department. And it is um, my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest tonight. Essentially, the way it will happen is I will talk a little bit about her and give her a moment to, um, to breathe. <laughs> uh, and then um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Larissa, and she'll read for us. And I know for my students in here, it's going to be something that you haven't read yet. Uh, so that's exciting. And then um, I will return for a conversation where I get to ask some of your questions that you sent me, some of my own questions um, up here on the stage with Larissa. And then you can all ask some questions too. We'll have time for a Q&A too at the end. Before that, just a quick word on masks and cell phones. Um, please keep the masks on and the cell phones off so we can continue for the evening together. And thank you for joining us in person and via live stream tonight. Uh, this is my first in-person event since March 2020. Uh, and I'm so grateful to you all and science for making this possible. Uh, thank you to Athleen Collins and her team at the Cultural Center who make everything you see here possible. Uh, and of course, to the incredible novelist and my fellow professor in the English department, Martha McPhee, who runs this fantastic series, Great Writers, Great Readings. Um, every year, she asks me for my dream list, and every year, somehow, she makes it come true. So um, that is my lucky part of this job. Uh, and now on to our guest of the evening. Larissa Pham is an author and an essayist living in Brooklyn, New York. She is the author of the novella Fantasian, and her newest book was just published this year and is a collection of essays called Pop Song, Adventures in Art and Intimacy, about which Harper's Bazaar said, Larissa Pham's debut essay collection is like a literary mixtape, a volume that feels comfortably worn in and, rel and relatably restless. And I agree. <laughs> her essays and criticism have appeared in the Paris Review Daily, Book Forum, Guernica, The Nation, and elsewhere. She studied painting and art history at Yale and is currently getting her MFA in fiction, although she's still going to write nonfiction, or she'd better anyway. <laughs> we are so lucky that she agreed to be our first reader for the 18th annual series of Great Writers, Great Readings. Please welcome her to the podium. Hello, this is my first in-person event um, for this book, basically, ever. It came out in May, but it's so exciting to be in a room full of people. Um, thank you for that introduction. It was really beautiful. Um, I'm going to set a timer on my phone so I don't run over. Um, oh, there's a Google Maps from getting here. Um, right. So I'm going to read from this chapter on photography called um, Camera Roll, and the subtitle is Notes on Longing. Um, I'll be skipping around a little bit, but it's kind of designed so you can read it in any order. The most intimate photographs are photographs made at night in the dark. There are two ways to take a photograph at night. You can set the aperture large and the shutter speed slow. Opening the aperture gives the photograph a small depth of field but it lets as much light in through the lens as possible. When the light hits the lens, it reflects through a series of mirrors onto the film, which is sensitive. The slower the shutter speed, the more time the light, the longer the light can pass through. This way, the film has more time to react to its presence, building up value. This is called lengthening the exposure. If you do it right, and you don't always know how it will come up, you will have an image deep and luminous with true blacks and gentle highlights, the shine on a wet eye, the glowing fabric of a white t-shirt, a lover's shy smile in the dark. The other option is to use a flash. Here you can keep the exposure short, the aperture small, mount it on your camera and as the shutter is open, throw your surroundings into sudden brilliance, like lightning through a window. This process creates shadows. These are the two ways. One lets light in slowly, the other is a violation. When you weren't looking, I took a photograph of you. 
It was quiet and you were sleeping. That was the first of my many thefts. It was just, the light was so beautiful and so were you in it. Low, everything, the bed, our scattered clothes, the level of light in the room. I stood in the doorway, carefully balancing my weight on the floorboards so as to not wake you. Looking at the curve of your spine, the hard, pure shape of your shoulders, the way the spotlight outside your window cast a perfect parallelogram on the wall. It was early days, and we were still tenuous and new. I slid my finger on the screen to adjust the white balance, trying to capture the dimness of the light, trying to render you in a way as perfect and real as the way I was seeing you. How little it takes now with a phone camera. No aperture to adjust, no shutter speed. Just the image in an instant, forever, if I wanted it, which I might. I am referring to it now, though I have never shown it to you. When I was 20, on a friend's recommendation, I took a studio course in black and white film. You could identify our class on campus by the boxy 35mm cameras that dangled from straps about our shoulders. I carried my camera during the day, too, but the outside world didn't hold a pull for me. I, always, I already knew I wanted to focus on human closeness, on what happened within the interior. So at night, in different bedrooms, I'd make photographs of my lovers. Our professor had warned us of the difficulty of making pictures in dim lighting, but I wanted to try to see what I could take from that lush, dark place. I'd set the shutter speed to at least half a second or more, holding my breath and steadying my hands to get the exposure. Mornings, when I found them, were different. The light flat, gray, no gold in it whatsoever. Short exposures then and the aperture small, capturing every detail of the room. Days later, the roll done and packed with mystery. I'd rinse photo paper and chemicals and watch as faces rose out of nothing into the red light of the dark room. All year long, I made the same kind of photograph over and over again. That's the same, that's a kind of closeness when you continue to return to the same thing. I'm not sure if it was because my subject was constantly changing, or if I saw it changing. Those taut, intimate moments in bedrooms, the people in them moving close to me, and then away, and I never wanted it to change. I'm going to skip over a little bit. When you print a photograph, you're using the information you've captured. You place a negative beneath a light and you expose photosensitive paper to it. It's a projection. You see the image radiating through. The parts where the silver is built up don't let the light pass through, so the page stays white. But the areas of a shadow in a photograph, those are clear on a negative. You can see right through. My night exposures. The film for those was nearly transparent, tiny smears of silver marking a smile, a highlight on skin, white teeth. How little there was that had been exposed, and how tenuous. How little of you had I captured? How little of you had, had you let me witness? Somewhere in North Africa, in 12,000 BC, a girl is watching an image of the landscape shimmer vibrantly upside down on the inside of her tent. Outside, there are animals running. She knows because she can see them. The light is coming through a tiny hole in its, in its exterior, and the world streams through. When she opens the flap of the tent to call to her sister, to describe to her what she sees, the world captured, the image disappears. And in the 5th century BC, Moti closes the, the, closes the door to his study. Through a crack in the wood, the light passes through, creating an image on the opposite wall. Colors, upside down, moving. He is enchanted by this remarkable coincidence of the image's fidelity to the outside it's brought in. He studies it and records the phenomenon. He calls what he has discovered a locked treasure room. And a hundred years later, a young Aristotle is making a camera obscura, though at that point, he doesn't know, not yet, the entirety of what he is making. He is asking why. He is always asking why. He is watching the sun through a mesh of leaves, 
observing how the shape the light makes is circular on the ground. And in, 1950, in, and in 1544, the astronomer, astronomer Gemma Frisius is sitting in a darkened room, observing the eclipse through a tiny pinhole. The shape of the sun is projected on the wall, the far becomes near, and so within the realm of human experience as to appear nearly mundane. Still, when the moon passes in front of the sun, reaching totality, plunging the outside world into unreal darkness for 16 seconds, it sends a thrill of excitement through him, the wire-thin outline of the sun visible on the wall. It's Ovilar, France, 2012. I am 19, no Aristotle, nor Frigius. I'm studying at a month-long painting and drawing workshop in the south of France, in a tiny village too far west for its time zone, so that the nights blend into evening and the sky remains luminous thalo blue as late as 11 p.m. When I come back from making lunch on one of the last days of our program, our studio is darkened, the windows covered in cardboard, and when my eyes adjust, I can see the pale green shape of trees susurrating across the far wall. There is the parking lot, the edge of the garden, shimmering faintly as if in a dream. Two of my fellow students are outside, running in circles in the parking lot to give us something to see inside our camera obscura. I see their legs, their swift, dappled shapes, and I feel so young, younger even, almost like I've never been born. August 21st, 2017, New York City. You are watching the solar eclipse through a pinhole you have made with a cereal box and tin foil. You hold it out in front of your eyes like a pair of ski goggles that block out the world. Except, when you move your head, the tiny crescent of the sun moves too, ping-ponging off the walls of the singular obs observatory you've made. This delights you, and you do it again and again. I'm going to read just a little bit more. Um, about a specific photographer. Beginning in the 1940s, the Harlem-born photographer Roy de Carava made pictures of the black community, portraits of fa famous jazz musicians like John Coltrane, as well as intimate onstage photographs of the ordinary people around him. A couple tenderly embracing, a young woman in a gown after her graduation. Though he initially began his artistic practice as a painter, De Crava was taken by the flexibility and portability of photography, and he carried his 35 millimeter camera with him wherever he went, down busy streets and into domestic spaces. Within a few years after taking it up, he shifted his practice entirely to photography. His photos aren't snapshots, though, as effortless as his mode might seem. He never orchestrated his images, but they still feel deliberately, elegantly played. Looking at his photos, it seems to me that there's still something of the painter in his approach, especially in his carefully framed compositions, which often feature a single figure or poetic gesture. The silhouette of, a, of the back of a woman in a 1960 photograph reminds me of Edouard Viard's Women Dressed in Black. Another image from 1962 of a diner table setting and a coat hooked over the back of a chair has all the moody seriousness of another landish still life or an Edward Hopper, one of his inspirations, the ghost of a figure suggested for the coat's open collar. And I'm going to skip over a little of art history and talk a little bit about Rava's like specific technique. So if you haven't seen these photos, they're like almost like bafflingly dark, like it's just like shades and shades of different grays. And this was something that um, he was particularly known for, and he insisted on developing his photographs himself because he didn't ask anyone to, to get the, the tones right. So, and De Carava knew how light worked, how to light dark skin, how to adjust the aperture of his camera in a dim interior, developing and printing his images himself to bring up the details and the shadows. Where a darkroom technician unfamiliar with his work might have overexposed his images, his control of the entire process allowed his subjects to subtly shine. As a result of the sensitivity, his photographs have an astonishing tonal range of grays, charcoal, dove, ash, sleet, slate, which gives his images a solemn richness. He wasn't afraid of this palette. 
He embraced it and its uncertainty, knowing that the most important information in an image could often lie in the shadows. When I want a picture, I don't care how dark it is, he said in a 1996 interview with the artist Strad Scott. I believe that if I feel something and I have my camera, I should try to capture it. Even if I have to hold the camera still for two minutes, I will try. There's this portrait of the bassist Edna Smith, which I find myself continuously returning to. Eyes closed mid-performance, lips slightly parted, her face is stilled with concentration, her fingers on the neck of the instrument, an elegant blur, giving us a sense of the length of De Carava's exposure. It's long, but not so long that we can't make out the shape of her hands, the ring she wears, the strength of her wrist. And despite the image's deep tones in the dim light, there's a sense of warmth, of the embrace of the night. Edna Smith was known in her time as a musician, playing big band jazz and traveling with the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, an all-women band. Unlike De Carava's more famous subject, there's little recorded about her, one of many musicians who made up a milieu and, for some time, a rare female jazz musician playing in big bands. And in De Carava's image, she celebrated forever in this moment as an artist, enraptured in the act of making. In the dark room, Smith's face is beautifully lit. It's as though she provides her own radiance. De Carava rarely used flash. He didn't have to. He knew the image was waiting there, already in the room. I'll end there. Thank you. Never mind. Of the oh, great, they switched over and now everyone can I think hear. Think we're <laughs> um, Thank you so much. That was amazing to hear in person. Uh, it's very different than um, reading it on paper. And I think, uh, I mean, that's why we do this, right? That's why we have this series and why it's important for you as writers to come to these events because it's just magnificent to have the writer here reading their own work. Um, first, uh, I want to say, please buy this book. Um, I realized the other day, I actually own two copies and I loaned both of them out. <laughs> so I had to go to the library for mine. Um, but, uh, but please, normally we do have uh, books for sale here in the back. We can't do that because of COVID restrictions, but you can go to bookshop.org and Larissa's page is there and it is um, very easy to just click and order. Um, and to the book itself, um, I actually was uh, interviewing the novelist Alice McDermott earlier this week and about teaching and writing and things like that. And she said her greatest pleasure of teaching was that she could read something that she loved so much and then force other people to read it and then make them talk to her about it. And I feel like that's what I've been doing these first few weeks of class with my students. Um, and it's been amazing to be able to explore and be back in the classroom again. So thank you for giving us that gift. Um, for the folks who have not been able to read the entire book or have only um, heard what you read tonight, I thought we could maybe just start by giving a sense of the book as a whole, because it's a little different than a typical memoir or book of essays or novella or, um, so yeah, can you give us a little tidbit? Yeah, um, as I'm, the mic is so subtle that I like wanna make sure it's on, but I think we're good. Um, yeah, it's so pop song is not really a book with a core argument, um, which I think puts it in sort of um, contrast to a lot of like sort of like big nonfiction books that like aim to tell, you know, like this is how the history of salt mirrors the history of like Western civilization or something like that. It's not that. Um, but it is um, kind of like a meandering and very curious journey through um, a certain chronology of my own life um, set against these, this backdrop of like various inquiries into art history um, and like culture and, and music. 
Um, so there is a chronology to it, but it's also just a book about a lot of things that I really cared about, <laughs> and I somehow got away with writing about it. <laughs> well, thank goodness uh, Catapult believed in it. Um, <laughs> and so I know I've seen this called, and I think in the um, flap copy, it's called a memoir and essays. I've heard you call these pieces chapters, essays, um, and I wanted to understand how this book came together how you chose which pieces, because as an essayist, you published some essays, for example, in the Paris Review Daily, uh, you had a column. Mm -hmm. and so how did you know it, was a, it wanted to be a book? Which parts wanted to be in the book? How to put them in order? So there's actually an essay in this book that kind of talks about this process. Um, the book itself is very meta. I had a reviewer um, mentioned very, very kindly, I thought that I seemed to be grappling with like the impossibility of language to say the things that I wanted to say, which is why I'm always turning towards other forms um, like art and music. Um, but uh, the book originally started as an investigation of contemporary or modern intimacy. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in like, what are those moments in a relationship where two people are drawing close to each other. And like, what is that, like, what does that feel like? What, what, what is like there, you know, what is that substance? Um, and then along the way, it turned into a book about love. And it being a book about love meant that it was also a book about trauma or all the things that that love uprooted. Um, and so once I had figured out what the book was about, it became a little bit easier to think like, oh, I really want to write about, you know, what it means to sit in silence with someone. There's a chapter about that. I really want to write about, like, what it means to chase intimacy with someone or, or many people through taking their picture. Um, and so it began, it began to coalesce around that. Um, and then it was a matter of, like, you know, here's the other part is that... Um, the book is also structured in a sense of like getting to know the narrator and the narrator getting to know herself, the narrator being me that couple years back. Um, so there is this deepening sense of also like self-knowledge and, and closeness with, with the storyline itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that also contributed to like how I was organizing things. I know this is like very general terms, but that's how I was thinking of it. That's Perfect, and I have lots of questions that will <laughs> get into, dig into what you just said. Um, although I think the first, you already brought up the idea of this being about love um, in this selection, which, um, uh, and in the other pieces that a lot of my students read, there is this you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the presence of you and the different ways you used that pronoun in this piece uh, or in this book? Uh, because I feel like it, it changed throughout. Yeah, yeah. I think the book is addressed to a central figure who is like the figure of a lover, which is like very Roland Barthes, like a lover's discourse. It's also very like Maggie Nelson bluettes. Um, there is also like uh, a, a legacy of this kind of like address, and you see it a lot in poetry. Um, and my friend Tony Tulatamudi actually recently told me, he was like, oh, it's called a complaint. It's like when he used the you, and I was like, I don't like thinking of it that way. <laughs> um, but it, it was definitely a book where I didn't want the figure of this lover, this person that I was in love with and who, um, spoiler alert, like we end up parting ways at the end of the book. Um, I didn't want him to be like a character. I didn't want it to be like, oh, like, you know, this this person who is like constructed out of words um, that didn't feel like the right model for what I was trying to accomplish. Um, and instead, it, it, it seemed better to almost write it like a letter, mm -hmm. to write it like a love letter, but also like in doing so, knowing that it was going to have an audience much larger than this one person. Um, but I think when you when you write something to a person, the person reading it isn't thinking about the author's person. They're thinking about someone in their life who might also be that person. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of a pop song is like, you know, when, I don't know, like Justin Bieber is singing about like a you, like we're not thinking like Hailey Bieber, we're thinking like the person that we love. Right. Um, and so I, I think I was also very much in dialogue with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the you, um, it's funny, I like that idea of the complaint. I think some of my students here might remember that I, that you often feels like a finger in the chest, um, which can be, you know, deployed 
in a really successful way. But this you, um, there was an intimacy and it was uh, in a different form. Um, sometimes it felt like me, sometimes it felt like someone I knew. And so when you say a character made of words, do you mean the choice to not build that character on the page and use a name or something else? Yeah, I think so. I think when you name a character, like you, you create like a little skeleton of a person on the page for mm -hmm. your reader to interact with. And I was okay doing that with myself. I'm okay doing it in small parts in mm -hmm. the book with like, I think most notably like Robert, the mm -hmm. professor that I have, like is, is real person, Robert Reed. Um, may he rest in peace, like someone who really meant a lot to me and Writing him as a character felt like something that I could do, yeah. but for other like more complicated relationships, it 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 didn't feel like fair <laughs> to like mm -hmm. try to try to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean it it is something that like one navigates like when writing about real people. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and yeah. I like that question of fair. What is fair? Um, because writers who have sat on this stage have come across all points of the spectrum of everything is fair game to, you know, very different. I'm having, uh, I teach a class called uh, Truth Versus Fact, and my nonfiction writers in that class will have to write their own code of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The goal being everyone's will be different, uh, although I didn't tell you that. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, So, and I think that's true for, for nonfiction writers. It's what mm -hmm. you're personally comfortable with. Um, and I remember, you know, so many, so many times as you're writing nonfiction, uh, so people will say, well, just make it fiction. Um, and so I'm curious, because I know you, you, know, you wrote fiction and you are writing fiction. Um, so why the mode of nonfiction for this particular project? Um. Gosh, I've been like talking about this in like all the press interviews that I've been doing, and then it always gets cut out. And I'm like, what? You don't find this interesting? But I guess like you know, I'm talking to a room full of like literature and creative writing students, so this is amazing for me. Yes. Um, I think I think with creative nonfiction, there is sort of this premise that like what you're saying is true. Mm -hmm. It's coming from life. So then your work as an author or as a writer is to reckon with the uncertainty that is life like mm -hmm. you're always going around the truth you're always like trying to do it but like you know we could all have we could all go home and write in our journals like a different memory of tonight and we would all be right but the the sort of distilled thing that we're experiencing right now like can't be experienced again um but nonfiction's like whole premise is that like it did happen Mm -hmm. So I think like the questions that it brings up are more about like memory and recall and you know language and like articulation, um, which are the questions that I was interested in in, in mm -hmm. this book. I wanted to write about these very like um, almost like meta questions mm -hmm. that surround nonfiction. Whereas like in fiction projects that I've worked on, like then you're also you're also building a world, but you're building it like line by line. So you have a different kind of faith. In, in, a, in the sentences mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because your whole your whole job is to convince someone to care about these characters and believe in them in a different way yeah exactly mm -hmm. exactly so you're writing you're writing like towards truth but in like very different ways and it's, yeah. I think it's just suited for different projects right and I love in I think in many places um, and we talked about this in a class yesterday you seem to write almost against truth, right? Purposefully looking away from something or, um, or looking away until you have to look at it on the page. I'm thinking particularly of your piece, The Art of the Bruise, right? Mm -hmm. um, where there are these sort of two really beautiful strands of the art and then your own body. And then only at the end, when they come together, uh, do we understand why um, the art is helping you understand your mm -hmm. own body and your bruises and your relationship with pain and things like that. Um, but you can't look at it yet because you haven't, you needed the art to, or it seemed like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the narrator needed the art to look through uh, to experience her own pain. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. Like, mm -hmm. like everyone everyone has done everything before and like what we're feeling is like not particularly novel mm -hmm. but that's like so reassuring because then like when you're feeling something you can there's usually like a piece of art or something that like will relate to that impulse yeah. um and I think that bruise essay which um first appeared in the Paris Review and then is like in a much more expanded form and I guess 
some of you might have read it. It's like 10,000 words long. It's way longer than it was when it was online. Um, but that essay or chapter is really interesting in particular because my narrator is moving through time and um, I'm like reconciling with things that I had thought were true or things that I had thought I had believed and then like writing from the seat of like a little bit more knowledge mm -hmm. and like that kind of like balance I think is what you're referring to mm -hmm. as well as like coming to an understanding of something yeah. yeah as opposed to like kind of arriving at something knowing what it means already right I feel like much of the book is like not <laughs> is not like that it's like I'm going to figure this out and you're going to come with me and we're going to figure it out together <laughs> right and yeah. I mean that's that feels so alive on the page I think that's oh, thank you so exciting um because we feel that in the sentences um and thinking about all right I'm, there are two questions and I don't want to forget the other one so but uh, last semester, I think it was, um, we had Gia Tolentino here virtually, um, and another power essayist, uh, and she said when she sits down and knows that she wants to write an essay, the question that goes through her mind is, what is the first time that somebody asked this question? And then she tries to go back into history to and lets that question sort of dictate her research for how far back she goes, you know, into Victorian wedding dresses or mm -hmm. Thomas the Tank, the Tank Engine or whatever it is that um, is her subject, right? And um, I know some of the students were, were wondering where, um, what, you know, the chicken and the egg uh, phenomenon in your work, whether there was a piece of art that inspired you and then you wrote, or did you have the idea, the subject, and then you search for work to then enter into the writing. I think it's both. Mm -hmm. um, I think my sort of equivalent to Gia's question, and I mean, that's like classic Gia, that's such a great <laughs> way of thinking. That's not a way that I would have thought to, to <laughs> think <neither>. at all. <laughs> um, my, my analog to that might be like, how has this been said in other ways before? Mm. Um, because I'm usually interested in describing a phenomenon and then I look for things like that. Um, so because I just read from it, um, in the photography essay, I, I, I'm drawing upon my own experience of like being an amateur photographer and like going around with my little film camera trying to like, you know, basically force people into like these really intimate positions with me so that I could feel like I had captured some kind of closeness with them that like I actually didn't have. Mm. Um, and I knew of some photographers that like fit that sort of mode of working, like someone like Nan Golden, for example, yeah. a very famous example. And then while I was conceiving of the, like these ideas, I, I ended up seeing um, a Peter Hujar show at the Morgan Library. Um, and a lot of a lot of the work in this is um, drawn from shows that I didn't see and had like a response to. So like I would see something and like it would resonate with me, mm -hmm. and and I would have like the question. So it it, it kind of feeds itself. But mm -hmm. then um, De Carava is in this book because I talked to my friend um, El Perez, who is a photographer. And I was like, oh, do you know about Dick Carava's work? And I was like, no, no, I don't. And they were like, well, you know, like, it's all about this shadows, like, the, the idea that there's, like, information in the shadows. And that was so in dialogue with these, like, images of the interior that I was thinking about that I was like, oh, this is, like, a perfect person for me to, like, research and, like, write about. And I ended up being really drawn to one photograph in particular. So it is kind of a chicken and the egg situation, but I think... For me, it does come down to having like an authentic experience with something. And probably being open to seeing in a different way, right? activating uh, your senses to be aware that, oh, I'm thinking about this thing and mm -hmm. that relates to it. Whereas so often we go through life and we talk about this um, all the time <laughs> with, uh, in my class where, you know, we're, our heads are down. We're just getting to the next place. We're not mm -hmm. um, staying open as artists to the world. And especially coming out of a pandemic where so many of us were just stuck in a room uh, and we almost forgot how to be in the world and how to interact. And interaction is scary suddenly. Um, and that there is an entire earth to be in dialogue with. Um, and I'm so excited to see art shows and go to concerts again and, and mm -hmm. feel that, um, I mean, you know, reading, of course, although some folks 
couldn't read during the pandemic um, mm-hmm. because it was too much. But uh, that for me was the lifeline. But it's still different when it's when it's an, another art form and you being a painter as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that idea of the same things being expressed differently and yeah. trying to um, filter that uh, and metabolize what that means and how what people... There are certain things that other the universality of certain ideas, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that is one of many one of the one of the many strengths of your work is that universality where you um, say something and we think, "Wow, I can't believe this narrator just said that on the page," and then a second later <laughs> you think. Oh gosh, I feel that same way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've wow. never said it out loud, or you know, or I would never want to say it out loud. Or uh-huh. right, there's this um, intimacy and bravery on the page. And I wondered, um, I've seen you in interviews refer to the narrator as she. Uh-huh. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about the vulnerability necessary uh, to go to some of the uh, intimate places that you do in this book and on the page. Uh, how do you protect yourself? Is that different when you were writing as opposed to publishing? Um, you know, what, what is that relationship like on the page with your narrator? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've, like, maybe touched on this before, but it's nice, like, to kind of articulate it in a wider sense. But um, I think as a writer of creative nonfiction, like, it's important for me to enter, like, into a contract with the reader um, and it's like, a, it's like a matter of trust. And there are things in this book that I haven't really talked about um, in any other capacity because I was like, all right, like it's a book, like it's like the pages are like next to each other. Like you can't scroll and like screenshot. Like it's like, it's like a package. You have to pay $26 to like get it until the paperback comes out next year. It's more affordable then. Um, but like I am like, when I put something into this book, like I'm entering into a contract with the reader, assuming that they're gonna like receive it with good faith and therefore I can tell them things about myself or my thoughts or my experiences um, knowing that they will be safe in this format Mm. knowing that a book like allows you to do certain things but also knowing that like me as a writer like my responsibility is like I can't write something and be like oh I'm gonna jerk you around like I'm gonna like Mm -hmm. say things I don't mean and then make you feel bad because like you believed it in the first page and then I like I was like, haha, just joking. Like that, that to me is not like, people do that. They're very good at it. Um, I'm just not a writer like that. Like the, the vulnerability that I ask of my readers and the trust that I ask of my readers is, is such that I can't, I can't jerk people around. And so I don't want to. Um, so I think going into the writing process like that and just like really trying to cultivate that, um, that, that trust in that contract. But then also, yeah, I think, you know, there's plenty of things that are, in my life that are not in the book, um, my family would disagree. Uh, but, <laughs> and some of them were quite mad um, at me, but that's more like in general. Um, but I think, I think thinking of like, you know, like where is my narrator coming from? Like, where am I writing from? Like, I'm not writing from today. I'm writing from even, even when I was working on this in the pandemic, because I, I drafted it mostly like while we were all in lockdown. Um, I know, but you know, it was kind of good. Like I read an interview with Stephen King where he was like, you know, like my writing's been going great. And I was like, well, you know, it's true. Like if, if I must stay home, like that's the most, that's the best way I can be useful then, you know? Um, but even, even then when I was writing, like my narrator was situated, not exactly there. Mm -hmm. And I think having like a buffer of time was really helpful in terms of just like, you know, I wasn't writing, it wasn't like, it wasn't like an Mm op-ed. I wasn't like saying like, today, I believe this. Mm -hmm. I was like setting it up to have a little distance. And I think that allowed me to have clarity around like what I was thinking and, and give space for that thinking to evolve. And do you use things like journals or photographs to build in that critical distance to sort of see that she as separate? Uh, I mean, I think, yes, a little. I don't really keep a journal these days. I, I wish I did. Um, I do use photos, but I think, strangely enough, like, I think this, so the chronology of this is, spans about 10 years, like, mm-hmm. from, like, roughly when I'm, like, I, I always say, like, oh, 17 to 27, um, and I'm, well, 
turning 29 soon. <laughs> so there is a little bit of distance from like where my, where the sort of end point of my narrator is. Um, but I think, I think the biggest distancing mechanism was actually compassion. Mm. And I think it's because like at points in the book, like I'm, you know, I'm 16 years old, I'm 17, I'm like very young and I'm writing from enough distance that I have like a real compassion mm-hmm. for, for this person who I no longer see as like me, but it's clearly still me. And I right. think that is like really helpful. Well, I think it also allows you to deliver that person in full color and 3D in a way that's very honest or feels very honest mm-hmm. to a reader um, because you, you achieve that critical distance and we believe it. And, and the, there's that narrator on the page, the, you know, the person writing, um, as well as that character. And I think mm-hmm. um, I felt that compassion. And it, it, it actually, it made me have compassion for myself in many ways. Oh, wonderful. Uh, which that was, was the goal. <laughs> so thank <Great>. you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you brought up your age um, because that is something that I wanted to talk about. We talked about it in class. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring you here, I think uh, so often new writers, uh, young writers, right, they, especially when they come to nonfiction, they say, but what, what could I possibly say? I have nothing to say. I don't have enough experience. Uh, and I think that this is such a, a gorgeous answer to that, that, um, that age, uh, it's, it's point of view, it's not age. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm-hmm. and I wanted to ask specifically, since you did start publishing fairly yeah, young, yeah. Um, how, how now, again, thinking about that past, uh, that past you, um, now that you are in your late 20s, looking back, do you, do you have thoughts on, we also talked about social media and how mm. this generation in particular is different from, example, you know, for example, my, when I first became a writer, that was not a thing. Um, and and how, that, how does that affect your decision um, about publishing the work, especially personal work? That's such an important question. Um, I think when I when I was starting out, I definitely wrote things that maybe, and again, it's it's mentioned in the book, but um, that I think maybe exposed me a little more than I needed to. I think I attributed to like the sort of blog culture of like mm-hmm. the early 2010s, um, especially coming from a more like political background, where you know. Um, like it was, it was like the era of like everyone was writing for like Gawker or Jezebel, and they were writing about like privilege, and like they were explaining what privilege was to like um, people who were just encountering this kind of language for the first time. And it was, it was just like a completely different era. Um, I think we don't need that era of journalism anymore. I don't think we we've we've evolved past it because it, it did the work that it needed to do. Mm-hmm. So I think like now when I think about writing something personal, I'm like gosh, well, you, like, really better mean it. Like, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to serve any purpose. It's, like, you know, do I, do I really want to, like, say this? Do I want to have this on the record? Like, things disappear on the internet all the time, but things are also preserved on the internet all the time. And I think, you know, if you can, like, the most important thing for me recently has just been, like, well, you know, I want to write things that, like, I'm really proud of and that, like, I can, I, I will believe in. Um, and I think something that's interesting about publishing in general is that like you can kind of do it at any point. Mm -hmm. Like even if you have a day job or, you know, you're still a student or, you know, whatever circumstance, like you don't have to be a full-time writer in order to publish. And that also means like if you're not a full-time writer, then you have the luxury of of being able to decide like what you put out. And I think that that is, um, it's very important. I don't know. Like I think, I think sometimes there's this, there's this rush to be like, oh, you know, I, I really want to like put something out. And I think, I think that's really important, but I think, you know, making sure that it's something that you're really proud of, that you believe yeah. that, that has like really stayed with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, you know, I've written a lot of content in my life. Um, but I think in terms of like thinking about like, you know, really serious, like literary creative nonfiction, like I think it's just good to keep in mind. And for the second part of your question in terms of social media, I think, it's it's not as essential mm-hmm. as I think people say it is. Um, it really isn't. Yeah, 
Yeah, you'd be surprised. <laughs> like, I feel like people think it's like a huge deal, especially like in in like sort of publishing circles. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, like this author, like you know, like has this many, but it really doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. I and personally, I find um, I, I go through swings, right? Mm-hmm. And and when I'm in the in the depths of writing, uh, I can't do the quick hits of Instagram yeah. or, and, and there's that, uh, impulse to, uh, post sort of, um, your thought before you've actually processed it. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's, um, maybe, I think that's good for cataloging in a way, but mm-hmm. it's very different than what you just read, for example, and mm-hmm. having these years to think about something, even if you're not thinking about it in terms of writing a draft and then redrafting years later, mm-hmm. it's percolating. And these are things that you always think about. Mm-hmm. And then you come, you arrive to the page with years of thoughts mm-hmm. <laughs> to it um, mm-hmm. and, and matter and things like that. So it's, um, I'm glad to hear you say that it's not that as important as some people might think. <laughs> yeah, I think I think social media is great for some things. I think like great tweets are tweets. Yep. But tweeting is not writing. And that's like there's like a big this big difference. Yes. And I think, you know, I have friends in media who like we'll get drinks and we'll be like, oh my gosh, did you see like so and so like retweeted so and so? And I'm like, no, I, I didn't. Like, <laughs> like I'm gonna go back into my mind palace. Like, I can't. Um, so for what it is, like I think it's yeah. you know it's important, but mm-hmm. I think um, there are many ways of thinking through something, and I think like preserving space for yourself to think outside of you know really fast paced conversations that are frequently designed to make people angry mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. really important. And mm-hmm. I think also something that was really crucial to me while writing this and also is crucial to me now as I like hang out in this MFA MFA program is um, surrounding yourself with things that are already made that are already good Mm. is like really important like you know picking up um, like a book that's just like been around for 10 or 12 years and like it's a classic Mm -hmm. and like you've been meaning to read it, like, you should just read it, and it's going to be so much more valuable to you than scrolling. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> um, Not to, like, lecture. No, <laughs> no. Just, these yeah. are things I'm learning. <laughs> yes. I agree. Um, I think we're probably going to open up for questions in a minute, um, so I believe someone will bring a microphone. Okay, great. Um, so while we're working on that and uh, I know some of you have questions. I hope you do. Uh, I'm going to ask another question okay. um, based on what you just talked about, having the idea of having another job. I know you've done a lot of trauma work, for example. Um, and I wondered about that relation last semester and the semester before, especially when I would ask my students to write and write personal um, stories. I often, I worried that I would be pushing them during a time that they, that maybe was dangerous to push them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and yet so many of this, I was shocked. I mean, having taught nearly, you know, 15 years, the work la- the past year ha- was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, the students just were incredible. And, and so I wonder too, if there's some element of self-care that is important, though, when you come to the page, uh, whether the topic has is traumatic or the time that you're writing in is traumatic. Um, have you thought about, or do you have suggestions for ways to protect yourself, either on the page or you know in real life while you're working on this sort of stuff? Ooh, that's a really big question. Um, I feel like normally I'm asked questions for like you know after it comes out, like how do you protect yourself? But I think that the moment of creation. I think, gosh. Um, well, I, th- I guess they are a little different. Like, I think writing in a sort of hectic or traumatic time, like, will require different things for, depending on who you are and, mm-hmm. and like, sort of what is going on for you. Because, you know, maybe you're the kind of person where writing becomes this, like, oasis. Mm-hmm. It's, like, a special place. Like, it's, like, kind of your own space. Like, you need a lot of solitude to be a writer. Mm-hmm. And, like, when you can carve that out for yourself, like, maybe that can be really amazing or maybe you know your life is really really busy really chaotic you can't find that space you're frustrated when you can't find that then that's like then you need to practice forgiveness um because you're still a writer when you're not writing 
because you're thinking and you're always going to think. And when you write, especially if you're, well, no, I think that regardless of genre, like your, your mind is the thing that holds your work together. Your mind is always working. So don't worry if you're not writing right now, like you're still a writer. Um, so I guess like that's in terms of like environment. But I think mm-hmm. when you're writing about something that's like very vulnerable for you personally, like um, I mean, I think, I think allowing yourself to really fully feel things, it's important. Mm-hmm. There were moments when I was writing this where I was really like, ooh, I'm like in the back wall of like my experience. And, um, and that was like really heavy, but I was also like happy to do it because I had arrived in a place where I felt like I mm. could do that. Mm-hmm. So I think like also knowing when you're ready for something like, And I think it it calls to you. I think, like, in general, like, writing will, it will pull to you when when it's time. Um, And I think working on it when you feel moved to do so, like, whatever the topic is, is is a very good impulse. I think maybe the corollary to that is also knowing, like, you don't have to show things right away. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to workshop everything the moment you, like, hit the last period and, like, you know, save the document. Like... It's, it's, it's good to give things time as well because um, your relationship to it will change and um, there's a mix of like reactivity and reflexivity that I think becomes important in the finished work. Um, but it's, it's never going to maybe be like right that distant mm-hmm. that you might have like the best distance mm-hmm. from it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Critical distance, actual distance, all the yeah, distance. Yeah. <laughs> That's important as a writer. Um, all right, folks. We have just a few minutes. Um, who would like to be the brave soul to ask the first question? Sahar, come on up, and then you can go next. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I'm nervous too. <laughs> I think maybe come a little closer. I can hear you, but I don't know if other folks can hear you. No. Okay. Technical difficulties. <laughs> when I would do, like, Zooms from my room, I would get, like, really sweaty for no reason. Oh, my gosh. Just, like, by myself. Yes. Teaching? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, it's, it's working yes. now. Okay. Great. Great. Um, hi, Larissa. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. And thank you, Professor, for having us be here because I didn't realize until like when I was here how excited I was to be here, um, like actually seeing a, an author talking about her book. Unfortunately, I haven't read it. Trust me, I plan to. Um, my question is actually about your um, Art of the Bruise piece. Um, we talked about it in class. And personally, I feel like it hit me like more differently than I was expecting it to because, like she said, I related to it and it shocked me. And I I really like want to know like what like what was going on like in, in your mind and like where where were you like mentally or even physically when when you wrote about the piece and like when you were talking about the bruise that you keep poking at. Yeah, um did did you read the short version or the long version? This class read the short version. Okay, okay. Yes. I just want to make sure cuz I I don't want to like reference something that you might not be familiar with. Um, mm, great cue. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I was really interested in this impulse, like this idea of like, you know, um, this particularly like, this, this like kind of like feminized impulse to, to like explore pain and then also to like, kind of like, like this almost obsession we have with our own pain, like, um, and and the ways that that's like gendered and also like kind of glorified um in media and that was like my jumping off point it it did become a more personal reflection um but in terms of like where I was I guess like I I guess it was just like like most of my essays begin like I there was a phenomenon and I really wanted to write about it um and I I had these sort of references in mind that I was already thinking about but I I wanted to kind of gather information um, to to make a case for describing something. So I guess it, it stemmed from this idea of describing something. But I think more broadly also, like, and maybe this is the answer that you might be looking for, is, like, I always try to write for, like, um, 
like myself, like what I would have liked to hear when I was maybe younger or even like, you know, a year ago. Um, like I, I'm interested specifically in my own, like having my own particular perspective as like, you know, like a woman of color as an Asian American, like as a, as a queer woman, like, like this, this sort of particular perspective I have is not super well represented historically. So like when I, when I do find a phenomenon, like I like to be really specific and, um, and think about ways that like maybe my experience is different from like more mainstream narratives of something, or in this case, like this isn't really something that I'm super talked about. Um, I was trying to do that. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. It does. Yeah. Was it, did you have a bruise that you like looked at at the time maybe no I didn't actually like I was just I was just really interested in this idea of like you know artistic representations of pain and um you know there must have been like a show at the time that I was that I was writing about um for my column but I I couldn't tell you now what it was no thank you I really thank appreciate you. it hi Larissa it's nice to meet you thank you again professor for having us here it's been very illuminating. I was also a huge fan of the Bruises piece. It made me think of Clockwork Orange, my favorite book, in the sense of you talked about physical pain. Clockwork Orange is all about mental pain, and I just it was a connection I really liked because I love that book. Oh. But my question for you is more general. Has there ever been a moment in your life so critical, so spontaneous that you just had to write it down that second in some way? Um, hmm. There have been moments where, this is maybe going to be a disappointing answer, there have been moments where, like, I'm, like, like the camera in my head goes off, and I'm, like, I'm recording this for later. But really, like, when I write things down, it's because I'm, like, interviewing someone, or I'm, like, reporting on something, and I, like, have to get it right. Um, I don't always trust words right away. This is kind of a theme in the book, is that I don't always trust words right away so actually like I think what you might be referring to is like this moment where like yeah the camera's going off and I'm like oh I'm gonna extra remember this because I know later it's gonna it's gonna come up yeah I asked because you talk so much about the cameras and all, everything going into it and photography and I thought you know sometimes when I something cool happens to me as professor knows I immediately jot it down because I uh -huh. need to capture that feeling even if that feeling I have a post more about it later I want to know what I felt in that moment. So that's why you made me think of that again through the photography imagery. You're right, actually. You, when you said that, that made me think of one thing, which is, um, and this is like kind of weird, but um, when I like overhear some dialogue or like if I'm like kind of drifting off to sleep and I have like a thought or like, you know, I get out of the shower and I'm like, oh man, I got to hang on to that shower thought. I will text myself. I will like open a new text to myself. It's like just all these blue bubbles and I'll, I'll text myself the thought. Yeah, I do it's that like too. kind of low pressure. It's like, you know, because I don't want to open the notes app that's got a lot of baggage. I don't really like carry around a notebook. Um, so yeah, texting myself. That's, I do that too. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me feel not alone. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Anyone else? I have time for one, one more. Go for it, Antonio. <laughs> I enjoyed the reading and, uh, you know, hearing this discussion. Uh, I don't remember exactly what was said, but I think at some point you talked about how your narrator, you know, as they move from the beginning uh, to the end uh, point, they underwent changes and began to understand themselves, uh, you know, began to come to realizations about themselves through everything that was happening. And I was wondering, you know, that the kind of way that the story is told in, like, essays it's very intertwined with the narrator. And I'm wondering if, as the narrator went through those changes, anything about the narration itself or mm -hmm. how the story was told, the structure of it, anything, um, I don't know, underwent changes alongside the narrator, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think it was really important to me to show, I want to, how do I want to, like, I really like it when you can see someone thinking in a piece of writing. I am um, obviously like I read things that are like very ar well argued from the get go and like, you know, have like a point to prove. I think those are really valuable argumentative pieces. But the essays that I most love are the ones where you can feel someone thinking. And so I think mm -hmm. over the course of this book, like I am really like and this was kind of a challenge was thinking about like where is the narrator situated in the first couple of chapters versus where is she by the end? Like, what, what is the shift and how do I, 
how do I depict it accurately um, and compassionately from where I am, which is like, you know, maybe two chapters past the end that, you know, are not in the book. Um, But I think in terms of form, maybe something that did come up was there's a series, there's a section called Breakup Interludes, um, which take place mostly in Mexico City. And that's when my narrator um, is like, oh my gosh, like I'm in this relationship and I, I don't really know what to do. So I'm just going to leave the country for she goes to Mexico and um, the lover like visits her there, visits me there. <laughs> and like there's a fight and and there's sort of like this like as, like these sort of like fragments that um, show like I'm passing. And I think like that is where like one of the book's most profound transformations takes place, but you don't really see it because it's told in these like kind of like real interludes. Um, And that, that was intentional. I think that was, but I don't know if it was intentional because that was a form it needed to be in to represent that, or if that was the only way I could tell it. So that, I mean, I don't know if I could explain that. (laughs) That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a great question to end on because I think one of the reasons I am so excited to teach this book is because your this book and your writing in general explodes the notion of what nonfiction can be. And that Thank is you. always my goal in the class because often students come in and, you know, nonfiction is, you know, boring and just the facts and um, and it's so much more and so thank you for making my job easy oh, thank <laughs> um, you. and thank you so much for being here for getting here I'm sorry <laughs> that that was so difficult and it's for answering our busy <laughs> questions um, and really I, I can't wait to see what you do next and um, just thank you so much let's give a warm round of applause thank you thank you this is such a fun conversation terrific same here I love yeah. it Thank you. All right. And um, yeah, I guess if you have more questions, we'll put our masks back on mm-hmm. so you can actually come, <laughs> come near us. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And make sure to check the next Great Writers, Great Readers is, Great Readings is November 1st, I think, right? Uh, yes, Jotun. So um, come back. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>